the dangerous decline of Atlantic shark fin mako sees the Shark League and colleagues tackling one of the world's most pressing shark conservation crises. And while Rui has provided a valuable insight into the scientific advice, as this afternoon's audience is fairly diverse, I would like to take a moment to align our mutual understanding on the pressures facing mako sharks in the Atlantic, the timeline of concern and the actions, or in fact inactions, over the past four years since the crucial 2017 stock assessment. The stock assessment which ultimately drove home the precarious state of Atlantic makos, indicating in unambiguous terms the action that was and concerningly still is required in the North Atlantic, a no retention policy with no exceptions. So why is this such an urgent problem? This is our mako shark. It's a long-lived species, maturing late with lengthy gestation and producing a limited number of pups. In 2019, the IUCN classified shortfin mako as globally endangered, meaning they face a very high risk of extinction in the wild. In their favor, however, makos have a high discard survival rate. The shortfin mako is one of the world's most economically valuable sharks, sought globally for its meat, fins and sport. And for more than a decade, scientists have warned that its slow growth rates make it exceptionally vulnerable to overfishing. This global oceanic species is fished by many nations and taken in high seas fisheries managed by regional fisheries management organizations or the RFMOs. Yet no international catch limits have been agreed. The Atlantic High Seas Fisheries are managed under the purview of the International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tunas, or ICAT, which is comprised currently of 52 parties, including the EU, and covers quite an immense um, sea area, as you can see illustrated on the map. And who is responsible for taking these MAKO? Well, this graph here is for the North Atlantic. It addresses 2010 through to 2019 on the outside of this ring. And it illustrates clearly here the, the EU, Morocco, the USA. The EU having taken up to 76% in certain years of the total landings. So the EU's major role in North Atlantic Mako depletion brings responsibility to take the lead in reversing these declines. How long then have countries had to consider this advice? Well, ICAT scientists have warned, as Rui outlined, about MAKO's inherent vulnerability for over a decade. In 2008, they ranked shortfin MAKO among the world, among the sharks at greatest risk from overfishing in Atlantic longline fisheries. Similarly, in 2008, MAKO was listed on CMS Appendix 2. Then ICAT, since then, ICAT has prohibited retention of big eye threshers, oceanic white tips, most hammerheads, and silky sharks, as marked on the table on the right hand side of this slide. And ICAT took these actions based on significantly less information than is actually available for short fin mako. As Rui mentioned, in 2017, ICAT scientists undertook a stock assessment for short fin mako with sobering results. The advice was clear. If the commission wishes to stop overfishing immediately and achieve rebuilding by 2040 with over a 50% probability, the most effective immediate measure is a complete prohibition on retention. The result at the ICAT annual meeting was the adoption of a measure that continued to permit retention of dead mako through a number of exceptions, doing nothing to incentivize the avoidance of this vulnerable species. In 2008, unfortunately, ICAT failed to make time for MAKOs, with MAKO barely making the agenda of the annual meeting at all. But in 2019, ICAT scientists reconsidered the stock projections and the dire state of the North Atlantic MAKO was reinforced. This graphic here is an alternative of that um, table that Rui was discussing earlier. The graph illustrates the probability of recovery under different fishing pressures. The green line on the graph here is the line of zero mortality. Um, and um, this illustrates what would happen if no mako whatsoever died. The yellow line is the 70% probability line, which is accepted by a number of parties as the line that is appropriate, appropriate probability for sharks. 
you'll note that even under zero mortality, it would take nearly 45 years to have a 70% probability of recovery. Attack of 500 indicated here by the purple line, um, including dead discards as stipulated by scientists, has only a 52% probability of rebuilding the stock to the green quadrant in 2070. Important to note that current fishing pressure, levels of fishing pressure, do not even register on this graph. So what did the 2019 scientific advice illustrate? Well, there was a recognition that the 2017 recommendation was not effective and will not halt overfishing, let alone allow rebuilding. But the scientific advice remained intact. Adopt a non-retention policy for North Atlantic Macos without exception. Yet it is the clarity of this advice which has seemingly caused frustrations within certain sectors. As previously indicated, ICAT scientists have recommended retention bans for species of conservation concern for more than a decade. Parties, including the EU, readily heeded and implemented this advice for the previously mentioned species, big eye threshers, oceanic white tips, etc., all of which had less dire warnings. The North Atlantic mako population is severely depleted, primarily because of the EU, as the largest lander, had failed to establish a mako tack until this year when it is too late. The dire state calls for dire warnings and drastic cutbacks in fishing. As always, the scientists give their advice and parties get to decide how closely they will follow it. We commend the scientists for formulating and delivering clear, actionable advice, at least with respect to the North Atlantic retention ban and the South Atlantic TAC. So in 2019, CITES also featured on the agenda. And how does this listing factor in for MAKOs? Well, the ICAP projections were certainly an influencing factor in the decision that was taken at the CITES COP. And it should be noted that not only are all ICAP parties also parties to CITES, but that the EU themselves were co-sponsors of the proposal. And the implications of this will come up again shortly. At the ICAT 2019 annual meeting, Senegal and Canada led an initiative to establish a science-based short fin maker limits as advised by the scientists. Their proposal was co-sponsored by eight parties and supported at the annual meeting through floor statements from the likes of Norway, Guinea-Bissau, Uruguay, Japan, China and Taiwan. But this joint science-based maker proposal was opposed by the EU, the United States and Curacao. These parties pushing complex counter proposals that fell short of the scientific advice, proposing hundreds of tons of Mako to continue to be landed. The US Curacao proposal went as far, in fact, as permitting continued killing of Makos that made it to the boat alive under certain circumstances. So 2020 saw us working through virtual negotiations. Um, but again, Despite this situation, despite the virtual circumstances, we sure saw strong levels of support uh, for the non-retention proposal with new champions in the form of the UK and Taiwan adding their names as co-sponsors of the 2020 proposal. And yet again, the obstacles were the EU and US. And the chair closed the discussion citing irreconcilable divergence of views. 2020 also saw um, influence of CITES, as I alluded to earlier. Um, there was a meeting of, well, several meetings of the scientific review group, the EU CITES scientific review group, which come December drew a negative opinion on MAKO in the North Atlantic. Um, this was based, this opinion was based very much on the ICAT science. And as Rui mentioned, um, this was then implemented by Spain and Portugal for 2021 in the form of a prohibition on landings from the high seas and a prohibition on domestic waters for Spain. Um, this, subsequently to this, an EU TAC was proposed um, and, then, and then adopted, which given the prior decision by SRG and the actions of Spain and Portugal, the two member states with the greatest MAKO fishing interests in the EU, this leaves us somewhat um, dealing with what we see as a confusing and conflicting message. And a question can be asked in the context of Spain and Portugal's actions, what is now hindering the EU from taking that last step, from aligning itself with that growing ranks of countries who are supporting non-retention? And this now brings us up to 2021. 
This year marks four years since the first specific recommendations for North Atlantic retention ban in 2017. And so far this year, through the Rally for MAKOs held previous week, we saw strong statements of support in video messages and letters from the champions from Canada, from Senegal and the UK. And these video messages are being bolstered now by support from, from additional countries. We're seeing the NGO, civil society, sectors of the public, aquariums, divers, all engaging in this call to see the EU stand by what it's done through CITES, through CMS, and, and support this position. So we're now looking at some key points. So the conservation benefits associated to prohibition. There's a lot of talk about conservation benefit, what's important to us, what we feel is key, is that fishermen have the incentive to avoid MAKOs in the first place. Implementation of a non-retention policy provides an easier, simpler measure with clear conservation benefits. Discarding. It's a problem, whether it's under a retention ban or a tax. It's the same problem, but the good news for MAKO is that survival is high, with ICAT scientists reporting a discard survival rate of up to 77%. I believe that all stakeholders will agree that we need to do more about bycatch. And for North Atlantic MAKOs, a tack which will also result in dead discards simply isn't sufficient. We are well past the time when a tack would generally have an impact, uh, the impact required really to offer the best chance of population recovery. And over the years, the EU has championed non-retention measures for other sharks without raising concern over dead discards, as illustrated in this table below here. We can see all those proposals that the EU was a champion for, in fact, pushing for six years for a prohibition on poor beagle. The role of industry in policy and bycatch reduction, and there's an awful lot to talk about here. Clearly, sectors of industry are opposed to the scientific advice for non-retention. People are generally not keen to cut their incomes in the short term, but we need to look at the longer term issues here. And industry are not the only stakeholder. Even though they are domina dominant in the ICAT arenas, obviously the Commission has a responsibility for setting regulations, but what is necessary might not always be embraced by all. And this is where incentives come in. Currently, you can keep the shark if it's dead. And given Makos are a valuable shark, the incentive is then for the sharks to be dead. There is an incentive to maximize mortality. If Mako are protected as scientists advise, then the incentive is to avoid the sharks. We need to flip the incentive. And what are the obligations under the CFP? So this is about management for sustainability over the long term, precautionary approach founded on science. And again, it's too late for attack. When scientists talk about attack, they include discards. When the EU says attack, it doesn't include discards, but it reflects landing. So the actual mortality is higher. This is confusing, it's misleading. And if the actual level of mortality is higher, then we cannot be claiming that the attack will end overfishing or represent sustainability. And furthermore, with COVID, we're facing unprecedented circumstances. Everyone has had trouble. And up until the CITES SRG decision in December, Mako fishing was continuing. Overfishing continued through much of the pandemic and potentially, as we heard earlier, is still happening today. Makos didn't get a break from COVID, but there's a possible reprieve due to the CITES SRG decision implemented by Spain and Portugal. Virtual ICAT negotiations have proved challenging, but where ICAT is rolling over quotas for those species with management, this is not possible for Mako. And where there were proposals for MAKO in 2020, the Canadian Senegal proposal was particularly popular and simple and represents a meaningful measure that ICAC could take during this current COVID constraints and make up for the delays since 2017. So in summary, North Atlantic shortfin MAKOs are in dangerous decline due to overfishing by multiple countries. Continued landings from the endangered populations run counter to scientific advice for a non-retention policy without exception create incentive for irresponsible fishing practices that cause stress and ensure mortality and further delay a multi-decadal recovery. North Atlantic shortfin maker retention ban advised by scientists is based on scenarios that incorporates all sources of mortality, including dead discards. It's deemed the most effective way to achieve the substantial reductions necessary 
and takes into account the species relatively high post-release survival. It is vital to remove incentives to counter and kill this valuable and threatened species. Ending the overfishing of sharks and rays requires sustained action by all relevant government agencies, conservationists and the public. And alignment and collaboration between governments, environmental and fisheries agencies is essential. The EU championed MAKO at CITES and we now need the EU to stop hindering progress and to start championing the science in the North Atlantic. Thank you very much. I'd like to acknowledge today's hosts, the organizers of the events, and our funders, the Shark Conservation Fund, and my Shark Need colleagues and their excellent perspectives and publications. And I just recommend an additional bit of reading here, Rhetoric versus Reality, Global Ocean, Movement and Mako Sharks, available on the Shark League website. Thank you very much, Joe.